that much anyways. All right, perfect. So the first couple of slides aren't even that much anyways, but they're an intro and I have to give it anyways. So the doc what the doctor wants you to know from this lecture is not the specific details of every single process and the steps. He wants you to understand the differences between the processes and he wants you to understand why do we use each one? So as we're going, you're going to notice that some of them are only for DNA, some of them are only for RNA, stuff like that. Take note of these things. And also you should be able to know the applications very well. So when do we, what type of technique do we use for paternity testing? What type of technique do we use for COVID um, diagnosis, stuff like that. And then you're going to be able to read the results. This specifically applies for dot plots and, dot plots and southern blotting. And uh, yeah, we'll get to that in a, in a minute. So why, why are we learning this? Why did they put three lectures in your curriculum about these topics? First of all, because of molecular diagnostics, it's, it helps us in research, which is why Dr. Ahmed did end up putting a lot of details in your slides. He is a researcher. He uses these techniques literally every day, but you don't know. You don't need to know it that to that extent. You know, you're going to get asked about this in your USMLEs as well. So you know, pay attention. And also, it's very important in your in precision medicine. So, what is precision medicine? From the name. It is personalized medicine, as in, this, or you're going to give them a treatment that is specifically curated for their genes. So, for example, uh, you have a patient with a tumor, and you're going to take a biopsy of that tumor, you're going to take the cells, and you're going to test the cells for what drugs are these cells resistant to. So, um, you know, with chemotherapy, some drugs are... Some cells are certain you need to specify every treatment based on the genetic information. And basically, you think to know, which is why I put this little guy on some slides. And if you see this guy and you're cramming for a test or whatever, you could just skip the slide. I don't think he will ask uh, anything. Tamam? Okay. So, what are some uses of molecular techniques? Again, I really don't think he's going to ask you anything from this slide, but I do have to go over it because it was mentioned. So molecular techniques help us understand disease susceptibilities. So for example, the BRCA gene mutation, if this person has a mutation, they are at a higher risk of developing breast cancer. It can it also helps us understand drug responses. So if someone has an HER2, is HER2 positive, she will have poor response to cancer treatment. If we also use it for premarital screening. So you have some, two people want to get married and they are, you know, they're going to have kids. So you're going to conduct premarital screening to know, oh, if you guys do end up going with the marriage and you do decide to have a kid, that your child might have risks of developing this and this diseases. And this is why we need molecular techniques. It's also used in biopharmaceuticals and it's used in CRISPR. So CRISPR is a concept that he just used, you know, he just mentioned it, but it is coming in your genetics uh, course. So I might as well just briefly explain it. So CRISPR is just gene therapy. So for example, you're gonna take a, an egg, an ovum, and you're going to notice where the genetic mutations are, you're gonna fix them and mod modify it. And then you're going to proceed with the fertilization in vitro, so you know, not in the uterus. And then once the egg is growing, once you have an embryo and it's healthy, you're gonna put it back in. And you, we use molecular techniques in all of these applications. Nothing really to know from here, but I couldn't just skip the slides, so, so yeah. Now we are beginning with the actual lecture. So the first couple of techniques that I'm going to explain to you guys aren't used to actually analyze the DNA. They're used to facilitate the analysis of the DNA. First, first of all, restriction of endonucleases. So the DNA is a very, very big molecule. It can't run the analysis at once. You need to break it apart. And that's exactly you know, restriction of these almost four to eight nucleotides. And it's going to cut at oh, um, okay. Uh, okay, fine. Uh, I just noticed that the slide did not change. Now you're following with me. So you're going to notice that the, the restriction endonuclease is going to read the DNA. It's going to notice four to eight nucleotides, and it's going to be like, yes, I need to cut here. And that is what we know as a restriction site. Okay? So your restriction sites are usually very specific to that person because of polymorphisms. Polymorphisms are just very common mutations found in everyone. They're harmless. So this is what makes your restriction sites very specific to you. And also most of them are palindromic, okay? Palindromic means that you, if you read them from the right to left and then you read them from the left to the right, it's going to be the exact same. 
But there is a little bit of a twist to this, Yanni. There's a little bit of a trick to this. If you go over here, let's read it from left to right in this direction. It's C T A G. Okay. And then you're going to give you're going to do the complementary strand to this. So it's going to have to be what's the complement of G? It's C, yeah. So you're gonna put C, and then what's complement of A, T, another A, T, and it's gonna, you know, you're gonna go in that direction basically. Not you're not going in this direction, it has to be the opposite direction. This is from mole one. It's not again, it's not like that important of a concept, but just in case he gets you like a tricky question, you understand it. And then if you notice the, if you read it from right to left and left to right here, they are the same. And that's and you know that's what makes them palindromic. Uh, most of them are like ninety five percent are, but some of them are not. So this is just in case if he told you like a true. Never mind. I mean, he just emphasized on it, so I thought I might as well emphasize on it as well. Most of them are palindromic, but they do not have to be palindromic. Okay. And uh, application, there is no specific application. You just use it in almost every other molecular technique, so you should know what it is. Okay. Moving on, DNA cloning. DNA cloning from the name, you're cloning the DNA, you're amplifying it, you're making a lot more copies of this thing, right? And it's also known as recombinant DNA. That's just another name for it. Uh, for applications, he didn't really give you a specific one, but I will give you the one that we took last year, which is human insulin. We, we make human insulin for diabetic patients through DNA cloning. And how exactly is that done? Uh, on announcements, they sent you guys a PowerPoint version. I did write the bullet points for that there, just so you, if you want to follow outside the recording later in Muhammad. So you're going to have, you're going to start with a plasmid. Okay. And you're going to have your DNA of interest. First of all, a plasmid is like a circular double stranded DNA usually found in bacteria. And this specific plasmid that we are going to add to the bacteria codes for antibiotic resistance. Okay. And then you're going to have your DNA of interest over here. And we're going to cleave it using restriction endonuclease. Okay. And then you're going to cleave the plasmid also with the restriction endonucleases. Is everyone following it up until now? You can just type in the chat if you if you guys want, just to make sure yeah, that yeah, everything is clear to know. Thank you. Just type in the chat. Just let me know so we don't pause for a long period of time. In Muhammad. So you cut it with the restriction under nucleases, and now you have like a, a little gap, and you're going to use DNA ligase to kind of connect them together. And now this molecule is your recombinant DNA, okay? Now you're going to put this plasmid into the bacteria, and this bacteria is going to start multiplying and multiplying. You're going to grow this bacteria in what you will take in POD, it's, it's an agar. And this agar is going to have a, a, what's it, an antibiotic, okay? So as we said before, this plasmid has antibiotic resistance. So all the bacteria that has this recombinant DNA will be able to survive in this agar. But any bacteria that does not have this plasmid recombinant DNA will die because we don't need it. It's, it's not interesting to us. So the bacteria will continue multiplying and multiplying and multiplying. And now you have a bunch of bacteria with the recombinant DNA, okay? And then what you're going to do is that you're going to put these bacteria into a tube over here, and you're going, you're going to kill the bacteria. So now you only have the recombinant DNA, and then you're going to use restriction endonucleases again, and you're gonna have, you're gonna separate the plasmid to get rid of it, you don't need it. And now you have your copies of the DNA of interest. And that is exactly how DNA cloning happens. Are we all good? Okay, I'm gonna assume that we are. So moving on to our third uh, technique, probes. So probes are very important because they're literally used in almost every other technique. I mean, all of them are, Any, all of these techniques are important. It's in with him. Uh, probes, they are complementary single-stranded DNA or RNA. So just take, forward, uh, take note of complementary single-stranded DNA or RNA, okay? Uh, why, is, why are they important? Because you're going to use them to bind to the specific DNA regions that you are interested in. Let's use a diagram to explain this even better, okay? So you have your DNA sample and you have this area is your gene of interest, this area, okay? So what you're going to do first is you're gonna denature the DNA, okay? Now that's single-stranded. And then you have your DNA probes over here, which are linked to a molecular beacon, which means it's gonna give you a signal if it binds to something, right? So this is our gene of interest and here's our, our DNA probe. We're going to combine them together, and they're going to hybridize. They're, they're actually going to bind together. And this will give off a signal to let you know that, yes, the probe did find the gene of interest that, you, that you're looking for, and it did successfully bind to it. 
and uh, we use this concept in a lot of other techniques. Is this concept clear to everyone? Yes. Uh, oh, no, can you? Okay, somebody said, no, can you repeat the agar point? It's really not uh, that important to fully, fully understand, but I will go over it nonetheless, okay? Sorry for everyone else, I'll have to go, I'll, I'll come back to this point. So by what I was saying about the agar is that you will have your, you will have this recombinant plasmid. We said this recombinant DNA has antibiotic resistance and it has the DNA of interest, which in our case, let's say it's coding for insulin, okay? And you're going to put this in bacteria. Why? Because bacteria divides a lot and you, you're kind of trying to multiply the DNA a lot. And something that's special about plasmid, again, you'll take this in POD. I don't know why it was explained, but it's okay. And uh, the plasmid will divide with the DNA, with the bacteria. So you're going to use this bacteria to make it divide, divide, divide until you have multiple copies of the recombinant DNA. And any bacteria that does not have this plasmid recombinant DNA will end up dying because you, you don't need it. It's not, you're not interested in it. And that's exactly, that's the whole point of the agar. Was that clear to you? Uh, okay, I'm going to assume that it was. So, okay, great, thank you. So as I was saying with the probes, I think the probes was clear with everyone. We just said, you know, the probe will bind to the DNA of in DNA region of interest and it will give you a signal to let you know that it did bind. And uh, from this slide, he just mentioned a, a bunch of different types. All you need to know is that the RNA probe is not used it's rarely used because it breaks down very easily. So it's very sensitive. Nobody wants to use it anymore, okay? This slide, again, if you're on a time crunch, it's skippable, but I'll explain it nonetheless. Um, so you're going to have your sample that you're, that you're interested in, in analyzing. And you're going to have, you're going to add digoxygenin. Sorry, I don't know how to pronounce this, but it's okay. Digoxygenin or bite into it, just either or, okay? And if you use the digoxygenin, you're going to add anti-digoxygenin antibodies to, to the solution or to the sample. This would be your probe, okay? So again, you have a sample, you will add this molecule, so you can add the probe to it, to it later on, which is anti-digoxygenin antibody, okay? And in the case that you did use biotin for the sample, then you're going, your probe is going to be avidin. So these two molecules are your actual probes, okay? Now you have the probe, it did bind to the area of interest, everything's good, but you do not have a signal just yet, which is why you're going to need to add an enzyme. If you're using the anti-digoxygenin probe, then the enzyme will either be alkaline phosphatase or horseradish peroxidase, or in the case that you're using the avidin probe, then your enzyme is just any enzyme that's conjugated with biotin. And then you're going to have a reaction because of the enzyme and you're, you're going to see color. Honestly, that's all I'm gonna ex explain about this part. Will this not be tested? Um, most probably not, honestly. It's, it's mentioned in the slides, so I explained it, but he really doesn't want you to know like the names and all of these stuff. But you know, if you if you wanna be perfect or something, I don't know, you could memorize it and I explained it. Does that sound good? Okay, you're welcome. So now we're moving on to the first application, probes. Um, they're used in fluorescent in situ hybridization or fish, okay? So it's, it's the exact same idea. It's just emphasizing the fact that the probe will have a um, fluorescent signal attached to it. Okay, here, it has a fluorescent label attached to it. And what will this fluorescent label to do? It will detect the copy or the number of genes in the cell. So it's gonna tell you if there's gene amplification or if there's gene deletion. How, okay, here, here's an example with the breast cancer cells, okay? So in, if, if a cell expresses too much HER2 over here, let me just, okay. If a cell expresses too much HER2, then this cell is at risk of breast cancer or like the, the cancer drugs will not work as well with these with this type of cancer, okay? So what they did is that they took a sample, they took, the, they took a bunch of cells, they put it on a slide and then they added your probe with the fluorescent signal, okay? And then this fluorescent signal is gonna bind to the HER2. It's gonna bind to any HER2 it sees. And we, in this case, we, we have two fluorescent signals, green for normal and then red for the abnormal HER2. And as you can see in this slide, there is a bunch of red, you got a bunch of red signals and you have like almost only three green signals. Point being that the HER2 is amplified. The bad, the bad gene HER2 is expressed a lot. And uh, that means that this person is at risk for breast cancer, the, the drugs would not work. The doctor stressed on the avidin point though. Hello, I, I watched the recording. Sorry, I keep going back and forth guys between the concepts. I'm, I'm reading the chat as I'm going. So just to answer all the questions. 
You know, I'll get back to your point in a bit. Let's stay on fish for now. Does everyone understand the concept with fish and the gene amplification? Perfect. So fish is clear. Back to this point, did he stress on Avidin? Honestly, I listened to the recording. That was my primary primary source for the PAL. And he, he doesn't want you to know like digoxygenin, anti-digoxygenin. Like he doesn't want you to know names. He just wants you to understand the concept. But you know, just to be safe, you might as well memorize it because it was written on the slides, Yanni. It wouldn't be appealable. I'm just putting it as you can skip it if you're under a time crunch and you were cramming for an exam. But to be fair, it's on the slides, so you can be tested on it, okay? But there are some stuff that I did not include the slides because he straight up said, you will not be tested on this. Anything he said something like that for, I omitted from the slides, okay? Moving on, you have another application for probes. First one we said was fish. Second one is dot blot. Okay. And uh, dot blot is essentially a screening exam. Okay. So you're trying to see, uh, you have a bunch of samples and you're going to see who has, who is at risk of having this disease. That is what you're seeing with a dot blot. And how does it do that? It uses two allele specific oligonucleotides, two assos. One asso is for the normal sequence. The other one is for the mutation. Now, ASO is just what we're using, it's, like it's the probe. The probe is the allele-specific oligonucleotide. Let's just explain how exactly does it do that, right? So you're going to run the test twice. The first time you're using the normal ASO, the normal probe. The second time you're using the mutated probe, okay? So here we have our sample. We have sample one from person one, sample two, three, four, and five. And then we are going to add to this mixture, you're going to add your normal ASO, the probe for the normal sequence. And it's going to change, it changed color with one, two, three, four, but not five, okay? So what does this mean? It means that patients one to four all have the normal sequence, but that does not mean that they are normal. That does not mean that they are they do not have the mutation. Why? Because this is very basic genetics. We took that, okay, here is normal gene. Here is abnormal gene. Someone can be like homozygous normal or a carrier or heterozygous for a trait or just, you know, affected. They can have this, they can have the mutation, which is why you need to run the test again, okay? So we found out that for patient one, they have at least one normal allele, right? Same thing for patients two, three, and four, but patient five, no, they do not have the normal sequence at all, at all. but you know, we'll just wait till we see the other test, right? Now we have the probe with the mutated sequence. This will tell, tell us if patients one through five have a mutated sequence at all. So one, it did not change color, it stayed yellow, okay? So one does not have a mutated sequence, meaning that all this patient has is a normal sequence. So you're gonna put double A, okay? Because obviously, like, if it did not make a reaction with a mutated, mutated sequence, with a mutated probe, then that means it does not have the mutated allele, it does not have small letter A, so he is just homozygous normal, okay? Is this clear to everyone? I'm assuming yes, okay? Now we have the second patient. Second patient expresses, okay, great, thank you. Second patient expresses the mutated allele. The color did change with the mutated probe. That means he does express this allele as well. So patient two is A capital, A small, meaning that they are a carrier for whatever mutation you are testing for. Moving on, patient three, yellow, it's like patient one, is only A capital A, small letter, I mean, capital A, capital A. He is homozygous normal. Patient four, it's like number two. He does express the mutated allele, so he is also a carrier, like this. Patient five did not express anything for the normal sequence and only expresses the mutated sequence. So that means they're small letter A, small letter A, meaning affected. He is homozygous for the mutation. This concept is extremely clear. Does everyone understand this concept? Sorry, I meant this concept is extremely important. So if everyone has any issues, let me know and I'll repeat. Very clear. How to know the difference between two, four, and five. Okay. Because if you see the, the whole thing with the dot plot is that the two tests are not independent of each of each other. So when patient two, three, two, four, and five, two, four, and five, patient two and four both express the normal sequence and the mutated sequence, okay? So that means they are a carrier because they have the normal allele, A, and the abnormal allele, lowercase a. So they are carriers. They are heterozygous, okay? 
But five does not express the normal allele. It stayed yellow because, you know, probes will change color if they bind to something. Five does not express normal. It only expresses abnormal. So this five is homozygous for mutation. It's lowercase, lowercase. How do you conclude two and four expresses it? Because the color changed in both here. You can see the color turned red. And it also turned red here. Because you know, it's the same concept with probes. Okay, remember how with probes we said when they bind to something, they will change the color? It changed color twice in the normal sequence and the mutated sequence. So you know that two and four express both normal and abnormal. Is this clear? Perfect. I'm glad. Okay. Uh, here, I just wrote the explanation out if you guys want to read through it later. Uh, who would like to tell me whether sample one, two, and three, like, you know, are they carriers? Are they homozygous normal? Come on, it's like an exercise. Patient one, are they homozygous normal? Are they heterozygous carrier? Or are they homozygous with the mutation? Perfect. One is homozygous normal because as you could see, yes, perfect, perfect. It is homozygous normal. So here they told you that it will turn black if it reacts with the probe. It will not turn anything. It will stay white if it does not react with the probe. So one only reacted with the normal ASO. It did not react with the mutated ASO. So one is homozygous normal. Two, homozygous abnormal. Perfect. That is correct. Okay. And three, what happens when you're expressing both? Three heterozygous carrier. Perfect. You guys got it. That's amazing. You guys are good to go with any question from dot bot. Okay. Again, this is just the explanation. And now we are moving on to our next molecular technique, gel electrophoresis. So can you repeat hetero carrier? I can I for sure can. So hetero like heterozygous carrier just means that you are expressing both the mutated allele and the abnormal and the how do you know if it's carrier or not? Okay. Carrier just means that you express both the mutated and the normal allele. Because you guys, you know, basic genetics, whenever you have capital A, capital A, that means you're normal. And if you have capital A, lowercase a, it means that you're a carrier. Yani, it means that you do have the mutated gene, but it's not, it's not dominant. It's not being expressed. So you will just carry it and you will pass it down to your, to your you know, offsprings. So from the test, you know that this person is heterozygous, that they are a carrier because they're expressing both the normal, capital A, and the abnormal, lowercase a, alleles. Is this clear now? Uh, yes, but like, is the, the carrier also is always heterozygous, right? Yeah, carriers are heterozygous, yes. They can't be homozygous. No, no, you cannot have a homozygous carrier. If it's capital A, capital A, Annie, yani, you're normal. Yeah, you do not have a okay. Patient. Okay, okay thank you. You're welcome. Tamam. So, uh, are we ready to move on with electrophoresis? Okay, I'm gonna assume that we are. Perfect, I'm gonna assume that we are. So, uh, gel electrophoresis, the function of this test is that you're separating the macromolecules, so you're separating your DNA by charge and by size, okay? So let's just jump right into the process, right? You're gonna need a chamber. So it's gonna hold your, your gel. And this chamber is also gonna have electrodes. You have your negatively charged anode and your positively charged, no, sorry, negatively charged cathode, my bad, cathode, and positively charged anode. Very important to remember this, do not mix them up, okay? And then gel matrix, which will hold, you know, your, macromolecules, it will hold your DNA samples. And then you're going to have your buffer, okay? And he, you have different types of buffer, they do different types of things, but he doesn't want you to know them. He really emphasized, like, you don't have to know the names because he does mention them in his, in his slides. Just know that the buffers will help the mo molecules migrate and move, okay? So why is the gel special? Why do we have, like, what's so special about the gel and electrophoresis? The gel is a sieve-like matrix, Manato. The gel has pores in it, right? And it's through these pores that your, your DNA samples will be able to move and to run, okay? So if you increase the percentage of whatever the gel is made of, for example, agarose is a sugar, okay? 
So if you increase the percentage of agarose, you're increasing the concentration you're, and you're decreasing the pore size, okay? And this will make it harder for the macromolecules to move through the, through the gel. So let's take a look here, okay? You have 2% agarose, 4% and 5%. 2%, you could see the differences between them very clearly because it's easier for the macromolecules to move through the gel, okay? But when you go up to the 4%, you can see that they're a lot more closer together and you can't see the differences between them as better as well, I mean. And when you go up to 5%, same thing that happens. That's just the whole concept with the percentage. It's just for you to understand. And um, okay, I'll be moving on to how gel electrophoresis actually occurs. Okay, now I'm gonna explain the actual procedure of gel electrophoresis. Just note that right now I'm explaining the horizontal version which means two things. Number one, it means that your probes, I mean, your sample is DNA or RNA, and that the gel that you will be using is agarose. And I'll come back to this point later, but for now, let's just focus on the actual procedure. So you're going to take your tray, your, elect, uh, what was it called? I think it was, yeah, electrophoresis chamber, okay? And you are going to put a comb in it over here, okay? And then you're going to have your agarose gel melted, and you're going to pour it into the tray. And now the, the gel will solidify, okay? And then you will remove the comb. Why is the comb there in the first place? It's because you're trying to make wells. Does everyone understand this concept? I'll assume yes. Okay, so now you have all these. Perfect, thank you. Um, why, why do we have to make wells? Because wells are like little pockets in the, in the gel that you will put your DNA sample in, okay? Okay. Perfect. Play it. And then you're going to put your charges, fine? Here you have your negatively charged cathode and positively charged anode. Please note that the negative charge is towards the wells. It's towards your starting point, okay? And that your positive charge is your ending point. Why? Because when you're doing this one specifically, the DNA or the RNA, they are negatively charged, right? And you're trying to attract them towards this side, okay? So... You think of the anode as someone like holding a string and they're trying to pull the DNA towards them. You're, since the DNA is negatively charged, it's gonna be attracted towards the positively charged anode. And you know, the heavier the molecule is, the further back it will stay. Because if it's heavy, it's not gonna move as fast as something that's light, which will be like all the way up here. And that's like the whole idea behind gel electrophoresis. So does everyone understand this concept over here? I'll assume yes. Perfect, I'll assume yes, okay? And then after all of that is done, you're going to add a dye because you have all of these, you know, DNA molecules, they're separated, they're migrated. You need to add a dye to be able to visualize your results. And the dye is called ethereum bromide. And it's um, it's special because you, you will see it under UV light. Yes, exactly. The greater the percentage of agarose, the harder it is for the DNA to move, exactly. Okay, and uh, yeah, so as, as I was saying, you're going to add the dye in the end. Why do you not add the dye in the beginning with the, like, okay, why do you not add the, the dye over here while you're mixing the agarose? Because ethereum bromide, very specific to know, is that it's, it's not heat uh, stable, it's heat unstable. So at high temperatures, ethereum bromide will just denature and like it's useless, it denatured, right? So you must add ethereum bromide in the end and then you're gonna visualize it with UV light, okay? So, is everyone clear with the actual process of gel electrophoresis? I will assume yes. Perfect. Now we have different types. First one is what I just discussed, horizontal. The sample will be DNA or RNA, and the gel is agarose, okay? Then you have your vertical one. So basically, this one is gonna be standing up. It's not gonna be lying down the way we did this one over here. It's gonna be standing up this way, and they're gonna be migrating like that, okay? So this one is used for proteins, usually, but it can be done for DNA too, okay? And the type of gel used is something called polyacrylamide gel. Uh, wait, uh, I have a question. Somebody said, won't the agarose solidify while adding bromide? Uh, yes, but the thing is, when you're adding the agarose in here, it's still heated, and then it cools down. So it's just better to add the ethereum bromide in the, in the end, so it doesn't denature. So it's like all cool, everything's fine and settled. Does that answer your question? 
Awesome. Exactly. Awesome. Okay. So we're going to talk, okay, uh, where was I? I was at vertical electrophoresis, the sample we said proteins, and it can al also be a DNA as well. Uh, and then the type of gel we use is po polyacrylamide. Um, and okay, you can use it, you can use the vertical electrophoresis for DNA as well, but this is usually done when you're trying to see the like very small differences in the in the sizes. So it's like when you're trying to see the difference between, okay, this is your sequence, A, G, T, T, A, and you're trying to see the difference between A and G and G and T. I'll explain this better in an upcoming slide, don't worry, but just to explain what I was writing about over here, okay? In Muhammad, we said horizontal, vertical, and then we also have a third type, which is called pulse field gel units, okay? And this one, the sample is large genomic DNA, which is chromosomal. In other words, when you're dealing with pulse field gel electrophoresis, you're dealing with chromosomes. You're not dealing with DNA fragments anymore, okay? That, that's literally the most important thing to know about this, this type over here, that you're dealing with chromosomal DNA, like a, a full bacterial chromosome, okay? And the type of gel used is agarose. We'll get, like, we're going to come back to these points again right now. Like, I'm discussing them in more details right now. So polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis, otherwise known as PAGE, is the preferred method for proteins, okay? But it can be used for DNA and RNA. And the same concept that I explained earlier with agarose percentage, how if you increase the percentage, it will be harder for the macro molecules to pass by, and it will it would be harder for them to pass by. The same concept applies with acrylamide. This is not that significant, but, you know, just to keep that in your mind. What are the advantages of PAGE is that it, it has a high degree of resolving power. So you can clearly tell the differences between the sample sizes and it will tell you, it will effectively separate them, effectively separate them based on one base pair differences. Base pair is just a, like adenine, guanine, cytosine. So it can tell you the difference between A and G and then C. If you look back up here, that's exactly what they do. You can see the difference between a T and then an A and then a, another T. Okay, but you don't usually need that for when you're doing DNA analysis. So you just stick to doing a simple, you know, horizontal electrophoresis. So that's like usually it's used for proteins, but when you're using page for DNA, it's going to be very small differences. Is that clear? I will assume that it is. And then we have disadvantages. Perfect, thank you. Disadvantages is that the acrylamide is actually a neurotoxin. So people who are handling the PAGE um, gel are actually at risk of developing a disease because it's a neurotoxin. And also the polyacrylamide gel is actually very difficult to handle. It's annoying, it's sticky, and it breaks a lot, okay? And now we're moving on to our last type of electrophoresis, which is pulse field gel electrophoresis. Again, it's used for DNA molecules that are large, larger than 25 kilo base pair. And for example, if he tells you anything about analyzing a bacterial chromosome all at once, it is for sure this, because this is the one that we use for big DNA, okay? And how does it happen? You don't really need to know this, but he explained it, so I might as well. Here you have electric field one, two, three, and four, and they're going to alternate. So here you have your DNA, it's being attracted to this side, and then it's being attracted to this side, and they're going to alternate until the DNA is fully spread out amongst this block, okay? That's all you need to know from here. And Right now, we finished Molecular Techniques 1. Does anyone have any questions? OK, I will assume that there are no questions. And I have a question for you. It's a little bit difficult. I'd, I'd rate it a 3 out of 5, maybe even a 4 out of 5. So just go ahead, try to solve, and I will, you know, we will answer it together in a, in a second. Who would like to, you know, try solving this? Okay, I'll read the question out loud, and I'm just waiting for one of you guys to send an answer. And if no, if you guys don't know how to solve it, it's okay, because it's a little bit tricky. So hint three is a restriction endonuclease. Which of the following is most likely to be the recognition sequence for this enzyme? How do we solve it? Okay, honestly, good question. It's a, it's a very tricky application of the concept. So it's a restriction endonuclease, right? And we're trying to find the restriction site. Restriction site, one thing that we know about them is that they're palindromes. Okay. So that means when you read the, the sequence from this side to this side, from left to right, and then you get the complement, this is the step that is tricky. You need to, oh, sure, I don't think I wrote, okay. 
and you get the complement and read it from right to left, it should be the same. Why is D and C are the same? Are they? Okay, my bad. In the question, they're not supposed to be the same. Um, I'll, in the next slide, inshallah, it would be fixed. Okay, so let's just try solving this together. I apologize about the question, the answer key being the same. Inham, inham. Okay, let's go with A, okay? A, A, G, A, A, G, okay? Now let's bring the complement for this. What's complement to, like, okay, you're going to read it from this side, so the complement has to be from this side. Is this much clear to everyone? This is from wall one, honestly. So do we just, like, read it from, like, the sides and whatever has the same thing is the answer no this is the trick you do not just read it from left to right no you have to bring the complement so g complement is c a it's t okay and then you will read it from the opposite side so here we're reading from right to left to right and then you're going to read it from right to left okay so we'll solve the first one together yeah it's complement has to be the same right yes exactly the complement has to be the same okay okay so in this case g will be c and then a t a, T. G will be C again. T, T. Now you read it from left to right. It's A, A, G, A, A, G. Read it from right to left. It's C, T, T, C, T, T. Are those palindromes? Yes or no? Are they palindromes? No, exactly. So A is incorrect. And then you're just going to do the same thing for all of them. So we have A, A, G, A, G, A. I'm sorry, but what does that mean? Palindromes meaning you read something from left to right and the exact, like, okay, if you, let's say cat, shoot, okay, tac, oh, sorry, sorry. Okay, you read the word cat, taco. If you read it, it's, ta uh, it's cat, taco. Now read it from, oh, wait, that's not a palindrome. Uh, wait, give me a moment to search up a palindrome online because I thought taco cat was a palindrome, but it's not. But essentially, palindrome is just something that you read the same from the from the left to the right and then from the right to the left. So a good example of it would be, okay, something simple like mom, okay? Mom, if you read it from the left to the right, it's the same as if you read it from the right to the left. Yes, thank you. You you got the taco cat reference that I'm making. And yes, uh, it is the same forward and backwards. Sorry, is this clear to everyone? But isn't that impossible since the complementary base pairs will be different. It's not impossible. Sometimes it does work out this way as seen in example C, okay? Let me show you example. I mean like um, answer choice C. Okay, this one. You're going to have A, A, G, G, A, A. Okay. Oh wait, actually, hold on. Uh-huh, okay. I'm very sorry. Uh, I think I made a mistake with the answer choices. Let's use this one, okay? Answer che answer choice C was supposed to be A, A, C, G, C, T, T, and I didn't put it in, and that's why maybe you guys were confused. Let's just deal with this one, okay? A, A, G, C, T, T, okay? And you're going to read it from the left to the right, like this. Now let's get the complement for this strand, okay? T, it's going to be A. T is also A. C would be G. G would be C. A is T. A is T. Is this concept clear to everyone? Like what I'm doing at the moment, the complement. Is it clear to everyone? This is from last uh, semester, mole one. Perfect. Now read this trend. Okay, here and here. Read this trend from right to left from this direction. It is the exact same as the original one. It is A, A, G, C, T, T. So does everyone understand how you're supposed to get the palindromic sequence? Yes, yes. Always go from left to the right for the first strand. It has nothing to do with five prime, three prime. No, because this is like an old concept. You don't have, it's not, you don't have to go into that many details. Just always go from the left to the right for now.
So does everyone understand this? All right, great. So again, I'm really sorry about not including the correct answer choice. It's supposed to be here. Instead, I accidentally put C and D the same. So inshallah, when uh, I'll have, I don't know, I'll just send it over again with the correction. And yeah, with that, we're starting mole two. Is everyone ready to begin with molecular techniques two? So we only read left to right. Yes, you will start off by reading left to the right. Okay, left to the right. And then you're going to get the complement and then you're going to read right to the left, okay? Is that good? Perfect. And now we are going to be doing uh, blotting, okay? So you have three different types of blots, the Southern blot, the Northern blot, and the Western blot. In short, the most important difference is that the Southern blot is analyzing a DNA sample, the Northern blot is analyzing the RNA sample, and the Western blot is analyzing a protein sample. And now we're gonna get into the details. So Southern blot, you are trying to ana analyze a specific gene or DNA without having to clone it, okay? The steps are, do I have a diagram? Yeah, okay. Steps are, first thing, you're gonna extract the DNA from the cell. You're going to cut it with restriction enzymes to make it smaller. You're going to run it on gel. So you, you're still going to use gel electrophoresis in Southern blotting. And then you are going to denature the DNA with the alka with an alkali. And this is because you're trying to make the double-stranded DNA into a single strand. Why do you need to make it into a single strand? Because we want to allow probe binding in Southern blotting, okay? And then you're going to transfer the electrophoresis onto another membrane, usually a nylon. And then on that nylon membrane, you will hybridize it with a probe. And now you're, you're going to be able to see this the D DNA that you're interested in. It's okay, we're gonna go through this again with a visual diagram. First, we have our genomic DNA. Restriction enzy enzymes will digest it. And now you have shorter fragments, okay? And then you put these shorter fragments in gel electrophoresis. They migrate, they give you the different sizes. Then you're going to denature it with alkaline. So you're just going to put alkaline over this to make sure it's single stranded now. And then you're going to, you know, you're going to like, you're going to do the southern blotting, which is get a nylon or a nit nitrocellulose membrane and just kind of press it on top of the gel electrophoresis so that it diffuses through, so that it gets copied onto. Ethidium bromide is the alkaline? No. Ethidium bromide is not, do not. Do, do not confuse those two. Ethidium bromide is just a dye. It's it's like a, a stain, okay? And you're going to use it so you could be able to see the results. But alkaline is a completely different chemical that you use in Southern blotting specifically so that you can make the double-stranded DNA single-stranded. You do not usually use alkaline in gel electrophoresis. This is an extra extra step in Southern blotting. Is this clear? Yes, alkaline will just separate the two DNA strands, makes it single-stranded. Ethidium bromide is a stain, it's a dye. Awesome, okay. And then you're going to, you're going to get the nylon membrane or a nitrocellulose membrane, and you're going to press it on top of the electrophoresis because you're trying to get it to transfer. Why? Because gel, like the agarose gel is just difficult to work with. You want something more sturdy so you can actually run the probe analysis on. And then خلاص, DNA got transferred. You're going to add the, the probes in a, in a bag. And the probes are going to bind to the areas of interest. And they're going to show a color change. Let's change the color. Okay. You're going to show you color changes. Is the procedure clear? I'm assuming that the procedure is clear. So, OK. Now you have two different, like, um, two different types of dyes or stains that you can use with Southern blotting, either a radioactive one, which is what we usually use because it shows it better, or you could use a chromogenic one. This is how they both look, nothing much to know here. Okay, now we're gonna talk about application. After washing the probes, won't this affect the result? No, because when you're washing the probes, you're trying to get rid of any probe that did not bind to, to the gene that you're interested in. So here we have like A, B, and then you have probes A, and C, okay? So you're going to add the probes here, okay? Okay, so you're going to add probes A and C. Probe A will find probe, like the genetic A, genetic sequence A, and it's gonna to bind to it. 
But probe C, it looks around, there's nothing to bind to. So you're gonna wash it away so that there's no nothing like lying around and affecting your result. It won't actually wash away any of the genetic information. Is that clear? Good, okay. So now we're gonna talk about the Southern blot applications. So first one, it's used in oncology. So people use the Southern blotting technique to see, are there any specific gene sequences that promote cancer? Are there any that will prevent cancer? Stuff like that. It's also used in classifying organisms. You're going to be able to detect specific gene sequences that are specific to that organism. It's also used in DNA cloning. It's also used in forensics and parentage testing. This will come, like this will come up later in our slides, okay? Because Molecular, molecular techniques, it's not you, you use them only in this technique and you only use them in this technique. As you're seeing, we keep using restriction en enzymes in every other technique. We're using gel electrophoresis even in Southern blotting. So they kind of like all go with each other. They just have different names. Uh, and then this is the most important one. This is the one I want you guys to focus with me on. D it detects DNA mutations that will cause loss or gain of restriction sites, okay? Restriction sites for the restriction endonucleases, okay? And this will cause the pattern of bands to differ and we'll explain how now, okay? So if you have a loss of a restriction site, this means that the endonuclease will not cut, okay? You lose a restriction site, the endonuclease, the enzyme is reading the DNA and it's not gonna find a restriction site. So it is simply not going to cut the DNA. This will lead to a larger DNA, okay? No, probes are not restriction sites, okay? Probes are, let's go back to the slide. Um, here. Probes are just sequences of complementary DNA or RNA that you make to specifically bind to DNA that you're interested in. A restriction site is sequences of DNA that an, an enzyme, an endonuclease, will read to snip the DNA, okay? But probe is it, it does not have anything to do with the restriction. And in what case would a restriction site be lost in a human being? There are a lot of examples we'll get to later on in the lecture. But just know that some mutations will cause the restriction site to be lost. Some mutations will cause a restriction site to be gained. But a specific example I'll give you later on in the lecture, inshallah. Okay. Um, and about the unwashed probes, you're welcome. About the unwashed probes, did you get it? Okay, great. Uh, where were we? Oh, yes, we were here. So as I, as I was saying, some mutations will cause a loss of restriction site. That means the endonuclease will not cut. And that means you have a larger DNA than usual. And if you apply your knowledge from gel, gel electrophoresis, here we have our anode. You always have your anode at the bottom of the test. And they're migrating in this direction. They're migrating in this direction, okay? So if you have a larger DNA sample, will it be further back or will it be up ahead? And will it be around this area or around this area? Towards the oval, will it be the triangle? Okay, it, exactly. It's gonna be towards the oval. This is very important to understand because I think you will 100% get like a, this thing and he's gonna tell you to analyze it to answer the question or something. So. You have your anodes here, okay? This is your positive charge. And your DNA is migrating towards this side, okay? Not this side. It's It starts here. This is your starting point, actually. And this is your end. So the heavier DNA molecule will just stay here in this region. But the smaller ones, they're pretty fast. They will go towards the positive. And this, I, this is like an idea that you'll see a lot throughout this lecture. So is this clear, absolutely clear with everyone? So the large ones never travel, right? No, they will travel, but they're slower. So they stay further back. Okay. And the smaller ones, they travel a lot faster. So they're going to go all the way up in front. Is that clear? Yes. Perfect. Okay, so back to the idea. Perfect. Back to the idea that you have a loss and loss of a restriction site. We said loss of restriction site, endonuclease will not cleave the DNA. So the DNA is large. Large means it will stay in this region. 
Okay, but if you have a gain of a restriction site, you will have an extra site that the enzyme will cut. So the enzyme will cut more than it should. And now you have smaller fragments and it would travel further. You would see it up here. Is this clear to everyone? Okay, I'm assuming yes. Let's erase this a bit. Perfect, I'm glad it is. Okay, so in, in this case, actually let's not take this by a case basis. Let's take this one here, okay? AA, in this case, we'll assume is homozygous normal, okay? And we will assume that these two are normal band sizes, okay? And then AA is homozygous abnormal, as in homozygous with the muta mutation, okay? And we can see that this band is further back. We said this is our starting point. So this is further back. So this is heavier. This is a larger DNA molecule. So what can we tell? Is this a loss? Lar I mean, okay. Is this a loss or a gain of a restriction site? Is this mutation a loss or a gain of a restriction site if the DNA is larger and it's further in the back? A loss, a loss. Exactly, it is a loss. Is this clear to everyone? Yes. Okay. And then AA, the capital small one, it's a carrier, so it's gonna express both. It's gonna express both the like larger one and both the not larger one. It's a carrier, it has both loss of the restriction site and it also has the normal genes, okay? So who can try and tell me, okay, now we have the parents, mom and dad. Who can try reading this for me and telling me who is homozygous normal, who is heterozygous and who is homozygous abnormal? Let's start with assuming this is the mom. Oops. Uh, both parents are carriers. Um, the, <laughs> like the sibling on the left. Mm -hmm. is uh is uh, homozygous for the uh for the um uh, abnormality correct uh the middle one is uh is heterozygous correct which is carrier and the the last one is normal homozygous normal perfect thank you is everyone does everyone understand this I'm assuming yes. Okay. And here's just the answers. It's as we said. Can you write the answers on the picture? Don't worry, they're all right here. Here we have the carrier. And I don't know if you guys took this in high school, but Sani, pedigree, if it's half shaded, it's a carrier. If it's fully shaded, it's abnormal. And if it's not shaded at all, it's normal. So here we have carrier, carrier, as we said. Here we have affected. Here we have carrier as well. And here we have normal. All the answers are right there. Okay. So what is the difference between the blotting method? We took Southern blot blotting, Northern blotting, and Western blotting, okay? And then we have the blotting methods and we have the dot blot that we were speaking about earlier. The one would be hex square and then circle, circle, like this, okay? Dot blot will allow you to screen. It's, it's going to tell you that, okay, this person has the mutation, this person is a carrier, and this person does not have the mutation. That's, that is all it's going to tell you. But a Southern blotting, will tell you, first of all, it deals with a small number of samples, whatever, but it will also tell you that you have a loss or gain of restriction site. The dot blot will not tell you that, and it will also not tell you the size of the mutation. And it won't tell you whether it's larger or whether it's smaller. It won't tell you whether it's a loss or a gain of a restriction site. So just to be able to differentiate between the two. Does everyone understand that? Okay. I'm assuming yes. Clear. Thank you. Okay, now we have the northern blotting. Same exact idea. The only difference that I will point out is that it is with an mRNA molecule and not a DNA. DNA is so southern blotting. Northern is mRNA. And it's the exact same thing as southern blotting. He doesn't even go into detail. So I just think you need to know that difference. Now we will talk about western blotting. So western blotting, you need to do something called SDA, SDS page before it, which is the gel electrophoresis that we were talking about earlier. So first of all, you're gonna use Western blotting to confirm HIV testing, okay? 
And uh, that's just the application. Now let's start with what is SDS page? SDS is a type of anionic detergent, which is responsible for denaturing the proteins. Oops, okay, wait, let's start from the beginning of the slides. Western blotting is used for protein analysis, as we said before, okay? So before you actually get to the Western blotting, you need to do the SDS page. And this SDS is basically an anionic, neg yani negatively charged detergent that will denature the protein and make sure that they all have a negative charge because we know amino acids in a protein, some of them are positive, some of them are negative, some of them are neutral. So just to keep them all the same charge, you will add this SDS and you're, you're going to give them all the negative charge, okay? And uh, yes, exactly. Okay. Now we are going to talk about the actual steps. First of all, you're gonna load these samples into the wells and uh, as we said before, page is vertical. So it's supposed to be like this, as seen in the photo upstairs, not, uh, not upstairs, in the slide before. Here, it's vertical. You add the samples up here, and it will go all, go all the way down. So you add the samples into the wells, and then you will do the SDS page electrophoresis, which is just a normal page, but you will use the sodium dodecyl sulfate, which will give the proteins a negative charge, and then they will migrate as usual. And then you're going to do the Western blotting, and that is, you know, you're going to try to transfer it onto a nitrocellulose membrane. The exact same concept as Southern blotting, by the way, nothing different, just different names. And then you're going to add an enzyme linked antibody. Okay, so you know how in Southern blotting, we said we are using probes. Probes are complementary DNA or RNA strands, okay? But in Western blotting, you are, you're dealing with a protein. There is no DNA or RNA strand for a protein. So that's why you need to use an antibody. Just take no note of the terminologies used, okay? So you're going to add the enzyme-linked antibody and it will give you a signal just as usual. Okay, should I go over this again? Yes or no? Is it all clear? Wait, yes, as in I'll go over it again? One last time, sure, sure, we're, we're gonna do it, it's okay. So it's the exact same concept as Southern blotting, but with a little bit of different terms used. First of all, load the samples into the wells. Please note that this, you're dealing with proteins, you're dealing with page, okay? You're dealing with page and page is vertical. It's gonna look like this, okay? And then you're going to apply the SDS page electrophoresis, okay? And that is using something called sodium, the whatever, SDS, which will give the proteins a negative charge, okay? And then it's, so not DNA protein. Yes, please, remember this about this slide. SDS page and Western blotting is an analyzing of proteins. You're dealing with proteins only, you're not dealing with DNA at the moment. No ethylene bromide used? Uh, no, you can use ethylene bromide. You can use. Ethidium, ethidium bromide is a dye, Yani. It doesn't really have anything to do why, why did you think ethidium bromide was not used? Maybe because I didn't mention it, so you just assumed it, it was not used. Um, no, ethidium bromide, bromide should be used, and I'll get to, the, to, to, to that in a minute. You are right. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry about not mentioning it. I will mention it in a, in a hot second. It's on the next slide. And you are right, it is used to see the results. So for now, let's just start from the top again. You will load the samples into the wells, and you're going to apply the STS page electrophoresis, STS for proteins, you know, to give them the negative charge. Page, because we already said that page is used for proteins and then electrophoresis, you know, you're just seeing how far they migrate, the sizes, whatever. And then you're gonna do the Western blotting and how, like from the name blotting, you're trying to transfer it onto the nitrocellulose membrane. This is the exact same thing as we did here in Southern blotting, right? So without, this part, because we're not dealing with DNA, so we do not need to add alkaline, right? But here you're transferring it onto nylon. In Western blotting, you're transferring, transferring it onto nitrocellulose membrane. But note that it, you know, in Southern blot, you could still transfer it onto a nitrocellulose membrane. It, even nylon, like it's, they're both interchangeable. They're, this is not specific to Southern blotting, okay? So back to this point here, Western blotting, you're going to transfer it to the nitrocellulose membrane. Why? Because the nitrocellulose membrane or the nylon membrane is easier to work with. It will not fall apart, okay? And then you're going to add your enzyme-linked antibody. This is just exactly like, this is the probe that we used from the Southern blotting. But why did we not just say probe? Because you're dealing with protein samples here. 
So protein does not have a complementary DNA or RNA. It would need an antibody. Is this clear to everyone? Clear. All right. And then you're going to add a substrate because we said it's enzyme linked. So the substrate will react with the enzyme. And this is what actually gives you the signal, which is seen here. OK. So now you want to visualize your results. And this is the step where you add all the, the stains. You have so many different types of stains. Kumasi, silver, ethidium bromide. So yes, you can use ethidium bromide. Or hybridization, whatever. This is just different names. Familiar, familiarize yourself with them. And um, OK, so what's the difference between the two? Because the way I felt like it was explained in the lecture was that they're used interchangeably. No, they're two different techniques. You do SDS page first because you're trying to visualize the different sizes. You're trying to separate the proteins by size, and then you're going to stain it. And then you do the Western blotting to actually see how many times are they expressed. So if you add the enzyme-linked antibody, see here, by using antibody. So when you add the enzyme-linked antibody, and you see that, that's, oh, there's five signals, there's 10 signals, you'll be like, okay, this protein is overexpressed. Okay, so that's the difference. Again, SDS page will tell you size, okay? It's, it's going to tell you here are your proteins, here are they separated by size. But the Western blotting will actually tell you this thing that you are looking for is expressed this much. And you could base your analysis off of that. Is that clear? Clear. Perfect. Okay. So we're done with the blotting methods. And now we're going to talk about sandwich ELISA. So sandwich Eliza, you're going, you're going to get a, a plate, okay? And it has 96 wells, whatever, just you're going to get a plate. And you're going to place your sample of interest, in this case, an antigen. Okay, I did not clarify this very well on the slides, but basically, you, usually you're using Eliza to detect HIV um, testing. Or actually, Eliza itself has so many different applications, but the one that he is teaching you at the moment is HIV testing, okay? So now you're going to add uh, the... HIV antigen, HIV is a virus, so you're going to take the antigen from the virus and you're going to add it. That's our circle over here. And then you're going to add the sample that you are analyzing from the patient. In this case, it's a patient's blood serum with the antibodies, with, with the HIV antibodies. So obviously, if a virus comes into your immune system, your immune system is going to try to fight it off. It's going to make antibodies. So this is if, if the patient does have the antibodies, you will know that, yes, this patient did have HIV. Okay, so we add the, the patient's blood serum. And here are the antibodies binding to the antigen. If I'm testing a patient of, for HIV, where do I get the HIV antigen? From the lab. This one you have to provide yourself. Like it's just from the lab. It's not from anywhere specific. Okay. And then the antibody that you're testing for, which is the, it's from the patient's blood. Okay. And then you're going to add your secondary antibody. And it's going to bind like this. And this antibody, the purple one, is labeled with an enzyme. And then you're going to add a substrate. Let's put that in red. And this substrate is going to react to the enzyme and give you a signal. And now you're going to know, yes, this patient does have the HIV antibodies. So yes, this patient did have HIV. OK? Now, it doesn't always have to be this way. The whole point, it's called sandwich ELISA because it's sandwiched. You have the antigen, and then you have the antibody. And then you have another antibody on top of that with the, with the enzyme. I kind of switched the colors, but it's okay. See, like they're making a sandwich with the thing that you're testing in the middle. But it can come in different ways, Yanni. Here's another way of uh, sandwich ELISA, where you start off with an antibody, not an antigen like we did here. So it, it doesn't have to start off with an antigen. That's the idea that I'm trying to get at. You start off with an antibody. And then this is what you're testing for. This is the antigen. You added it. And then another antibody would come with an enzyme. And then you add the substrate and boom, now you have a signal. And the point is, you know that this thing that I'm looking for, this thing that's in the middle of the sandwich is there. Check. Okay. Is that clear to everyone? I'm assuming yes. yes. Thank you. I'm assuming yes. Okay. So now we're going to go back to the, if I get a positive, if I get a signal, patient that's positive, absolutely. If you do get a signal, that means your patient is positive for whatever it is that you're testing for. In our case, HIV. Okay? And if you don't get a signal, this patient is negative. So ELISA, even though it's like it's very commonly used for HIV testing, 
uh, it has a 20% risk of being a false positive. So sometimes something does bind, you get a signal, but it wasn't HIV antibody. It was something random. You, I don't know, something went wrong with the exam, okay? Which is why we always follow it up with Western blotting. Remember how I said earlier about Western blotting, it's used to confirm the HIV testing? Yes, um, okay. So I'm bringing it back now. It is used to confirm that the ELISA test was actually a true positive. I remember the doctor mentioning that we use something not related, but we can use it to confirm. Uh, I think he was talking about the Western blotting because this is the concept that he's, he was teaching in the lecture. You use ELISA, it gives you a false positive. So you must follow it up with a Western blotting. So I think you're talking about the Western blotting right now. Yes, exactly. Okay, so let's take a look at a picture here. You have patient one, patient two, patient three. Patient one, you did ELISA, positive, positive, negative. So you're going to make sure that these are not false positives. They are not like a by mistake thing. Because you know what a false positive is. It says it's positive for HIV when this patient is actually not positive for HIV. So you're going to do a Western blot. This is your confirmatory testing. And you are going to run the analysis. Here's the Western blot. There's nothing really to see here other than the fact that something did show up. So this is a true positive. This patient does have HIV. This patient does not. So this was a false positive. He tested positive by ELISA, tested negative by Western blot. And then you have the negative, negative. You don't need to follow it up with the Western blot, but they're just showing you. So you might be like, um, why do we not just do Western blotting from the beginning if ELISA could be a false positive? Because Western blots are expensive, they're old, they take time, okay? The whole three blotting, Southern blotting, Northern blotting, Western blotting, are all a little bit outdated. People have newer methods now, but they're still teaching you them because you're gonna be tested on them in the exam, okay? And the reason, again, you don't just do Western blotting from the beginning because you might be a negative. So why would you need to do a Western blot if you're just negative from ELISA, okay? Uh, I hope that made sense. Is that, is that clear for everyone? I'm assuming yes. And with that, yeah. we, thank you. With that, we finished molecular techniques too. So would anyone like me to re revisit any concept from what we just explained? Okay, I'm assuming not. So we have a question. This might be a little bit tricky. So take your time solving it. When you guys see something this long, when you see a question this long in the exam, just read the last sentence. Which of the statements below is most accurate res with respect to the daughter? So we're trying to just see, is the daughter homozygous normal, heterozygous or homozygous with the mutation, okay? So I'm going to give you guys a hot second to try and solve this and we'll solve it together after. Um, can we use like the crossing method to solve this? You can, but I think the question you'd have to ask is, is it necessary in this case? You, they give you a test result over here. Would it be E? Okay. Uh, let's, let me just check real quick. Okay. Yeah, you're right. It is E. So let's just, cause I forgot, like it, it took me a while to, it didn't take me a while. I, I solved this a while ago, so I didn't know the answer immediately. Yes, you're right. It is E. And for those who didn't know why it's E, let's discuss why it's E. Okay. First of all, the result of the, the analysis that they gave you is a Southern blot. So you wouldn't be able to get the 25%, like you wouldn't be able to get the details about what is her percent chance of, ha chance of having Tay-Sachs from this analysis. Okay. Besides, um, let's, okay, okay. I'm sorry, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit scattered brained at the moment because I was thinking about a lot at once. So let's break the results down bit by bit. We see here that the father and the mother have two different, okay, sorry, give me a moment. Okay. So uh, this is the exact same concept that we've seen earlier with the Southern blotting from earlier on in the slides. This is your starting line. You're going to see that the, the mother and the father have two genes, one here, which is heavy, one here, which is lighter. And the, the, the daughter only has one of them, okay? Actually, wait, wait, wait. Okay, whoever solved E, can you just uh, try to explain how you got E? Because I'm, I'm a little bit scattered at the moment. The son has Tay-Sachs disease, 
and it shows that his is farther up towards three kilobytes, his gene, it's uh, smaller. So because of that, that means he has Tay-Sachs 100%. He's not a carrier. While the mother and father are both carriers, which means they have the gene for Tay-Sachs, which is at three kilobytes, and they have the normal, which is at four kilobytes. The daughter only has a gene at four kilobytes, meaning she's homozygous normal. All right, that was actually a perfect explanation. Did everyone else catch that? Uh, okay, since no one is objecting, I'm, I'm assuming that everyone got it. And I apologize for me blanking on the explanation. Um, you guys took care of it, though. So great job, everyone. Um, can and we solve this without using the southern block? Uh, no, because like the question is asking you about the southern block, and it's testing your ability to read the southern block. So I'm but sure like, in general. Yeah, but if I forget how to like do it, I feel like I can just like use the crossing thing. Then by all means, go for it. But I'm only going to teach you guys or like you're supposed to be able to apply it from the Southern bot. Because what if they don't give you, like they just give you son, mom, dad, daughter, and then they don't give you this. And they just tell you yeah. yes, the son. So that's why you need to be able to read it from the Southern bot. Okay. But you know, if in the exam, you got this diagram and you were able to get it from the crossing thing, go for it, Yanni. Why not? But you should be able to read the Southern bot. Okay, if we don't use the southern block, then the answer would be A. Uh, okay. Because it's 25% otherwise for all kids. I am going to try, also it will be A. Okay, honestly, I'm not really following up with this conversation at the moment because it can't be A and E at the same time. She can't have... Oh, actually, yes, it can be A and E at the same time. She can be homozygous normal, but still be at risk of having the disease. Like, um, actually, no. You know what, guys? Can we just pause the discussion on using the crossing thing? Just use the southern block. Does everyone Can everyone use the southern block to get the answer to E? Okay. And I really apologize for, you know, me being a little bit scatterbrained with this question. Uh, I have no idea what happened, but you guys handled it. And uh, inshallah, we can move on to the second concept. It is E. The answer was 100% E. And here's the explanation if you guys want to read through it later. And now we're talking about this question, okay? Let's... I guess A was there to trick you guys. So let's move on with the other question. Uh, okay. Take a moment to read this and just send your answer out as soon as you have it. Would it be B since we're talking about RNA? That is exactly it. Very straightforward. You're talking about mRNA? Khalas. B. Okay, you guys are still debating this. Um, it can't be a... First of all, does everyone understand that this is B before we go back to this, um, go back to the first question? Yes. Okay. And to go back to this first question, um, it can't be A because that would mean she would be a carrier. That doesn't necessarily mean it, she would be a carrier because she is at risk of developing the disease, you know? Like she, 25% is kind of telling you that if you were, to have, if you were to have a child, she is at 25% of being, a, of having Tay-Sachs, of being homozygous with the mutation. But that is like, not true. Doesn't that only mean like her children could have, not her? Uh, what do you mean? Um, Like, no, it can't be A because like, isn't the answer here E, which is homozygous and homozygous is like, it can't be a carrier. Yeah, She's just right. normal. It is 100% true. Like, what you're saying right now is 100% right. She is 100% homozygous normal. There is no debating that. The debate is whether it's A or not. And you're saying, you know, if she had 25... Oh, that is a very fair point. Okay. You're saying, you know, if she was to have a 25% chance of having Tay-Sachs, her children would also have Tay-Sachs? No, like, if, if A was correct, then she'd have to be, like, a carrier. Like, she, she can't be homozygous normal okay she would be heterozygous okay um honestly 
I, I'm, I myself, I'm, I'm getting really confused with the whole pun, like when you guys are using the square to get it, please don't use the square to get it in the exam. You guys got it from the Southern blot. You got to E from the Southern blot. That's all that matters. Is everyone on board <laughs> with going with that? Yes. Okay. Because like you guys are raising very valid concerns and I appreciate you trying to understand the concept fully, but I myself don't really, like I didn't review the concept of the cross and the square and all of that. And I don't want to mess your, mess the concept up. So is everyone satisfied with their understanding of the answer as E and Southern blot? Yes. Okay. Thank you. And for the last time, I'm extremely sorry about the mess with the this question's explanation. And now we can move on to molecular techniques three. First thing we're going to discuss is PCR, polymerase change, chain reaction. So this reaction is a method used to amplify a, a specific DNA sequence so you could analyze it. And Carrie Mullis created a three-step method. You denature, you anneal, and then you extend. We'll get to it in a, a second. First of all, what are the components that you need for, for PCR? First thing that you need is primer, okay? A primer is, it's the same primer that you always talk about. It's a, a sequence of nucleotides that will begin DNA syn synthesis, okay? So you're gonna have a forward primer, okay? And a, re hold on, let me use a different color. You're gonna have a forward primer and a reverse primer, reverse primer. So it should be kind of, oops, okay. It should kind of be bracketing off the DNA from this side and from this side. That's the only thing that's special about this primer. Other than that, it's it's just a very normal primer. Your DNA polymerase is going to see it and it's going to begin DNA synthesis. Okay, so that's that's the first thing that you need: a forward primer from this direction and a reverse primer from that direction. And then you're going to need a heat stable DNA polymerase, which is why we use something called attack polymerase because the normal DNA polymerase polymerase that we use, the human one, is is going to get denatured with the heat because PCR uses, like you will play around with the heat a lot. You're going to take it all the way up and then you're going to drop it back down and then you're going to bring it up again. So you can't use human DNA for, I mean, human DNA polymerase for PCR, which is why you will need TAC polymerase, which is from a bacteria. And it is, you know, it's a thermophile. So it's going to withstand the heat. Okay. And then you're going to need DNTP mix, which is just deoxynucleotide triphosphate mix. So it's just your adenine, guanine, uh, cytosine, just a mix of those. Why? Because you are create, you're amplifying the DNA, you're creating DNA. So obviously they need the building blocks for that, okay? And then you need your thermal cycler, which is going to control the temperature. And uh, we'll get to all of that in a second, right now. Okay, first things first, denature, okay? Uh, and denature means that you have to take the heat all the way up. And now your double-stranded DNA is a single-stranded DNA, okay? And then you are going to anneal, meaning you're going to drop the temperature back down so the primers can actually bind to your DNA. Okay, let's go back up here. You have a bunch of primers, this one and this one. So you need to bring the DNA all the way, you need to bring the temperature all the way up. These two will separate. They're now single-stranded. And then you have your primers. When you drop the temperature all the way back down, these primers will bind to the DNA. That's exactly what it says right here. Primers would anneal and hybridize with the strand at this temperature. And then you are going to extend, like the next step is extension. So the temperature, you're going to bring it all the way back up and this will activate the TAC polymerase. And now you have DNA synthesis and you're going to create, continue repeating the cycle over and over and over again until you have amplified DNA, okay? For 20 and 50 PCR cycles. This is just a um, visual representation. Number one, denature, take the temperature all the way up. Now you have single stranded DNA. Number two, bring the temperature back down so the primer can actually can actually bind to the region. It's called a flanking region because you're flanking it from this side and from this side, okay? And then you're going to bring the temperature all the way back up, not like as high as the first one, Bassani, just you're going to bring it back up. And now your TAC polymerase is going to start DNA synthesis from this direction, from that direction. And now you have the clone DNA and it's gonna go back into here and it's gonna keep going for 20 to 50 cycles. Okay, then what? Now you have your amplified DNA sequence, then what? Then you're going to do gel electrophoresis to actually analyze your, your results, okay? So some special things to note about the results. First one, the PCR product should be the same size as you expect, because when, you when you're doing PCR, when you're providing the primers, you know what kind of DNA you're amplifying. So you know that once you amplify the DNA and you do it on a gel electrophoresis, you have an expected size. You know what size it should be. 
So first thing you should note about the results is that it's the expected size, okay? Second thing that you should know is that when you're doing PCR, you have a blank, okay? This blank has all, okay, let's see. It has all components. It has the primer. It has the the DNTP, you know, your adenine, your guanine. It has everything that you need for PCR except for your template strand. So let's go back up here. So it's like a control uh, experiment that you're doing at the same time where you have where you have this, you have the polymerase, you have the primer, but you will not have the DNA template. Why? Because you, you want to make sure that your, your PCR is actually run well. Okay. So you don't you're not interested in, in you're not interested in amplifying the DNA with the reagent blank. You're interested in seeing if there's any contamination. Because if you do see amplification with your reagent blank, you know that yes, my PCR exam got contaminated and my results are not um, trustworthy anymore. They got affected, okay? Because you do not have the template DNA. Is this concept clear to everyone? Is the reagent blank clear? I'm assuming yes. And yeah. uh, great, thank you. And now we're going to talk about, about mist primers. Mist primers is just, it just occurs when the primers accidentally bind to the area of DNA that you're not interested in in amplifying. So you now you have amplified DNA that you did not want to analyze and it, you know, it's an accident, it's, it will affect your results. What should I do if I find a product in the reagent blank? You have to redo the PCR because your PCR got, got contaminated and something went wrong with the experiment, okay? And then primers, uh, primer dimers occur, occur when your primer binds to each other and they form a dimer. And that will cause your primers to uh, amplify. And you don't want that either. It will affect your results. So these are basically just all ways that your results can go wrong. OK. Now let's talk about how do you actually read a PCR result, OK? Uh, you're going to have in this column is your blank. Nothing is there. It's kind, this is your reagent blank. You know, nothing is there, meaning your test went well, meaning there's no contamination. OK. So there's no issue with the actual test. OK. Negative, they're just showing you if you do have a if you have a negative result for in the PCR, nothing will show up here. If you have positive, something will show up here. It's not telling you anything specific about a specimen. But now we will begin. First thing, specimen one, we see something, which means this is positive. Okay. And then you run the test again because you're like, what if it was a false positive? What if it was whatever? You need to you need to do the test twice, right? And you see that it is positive again. You're like, okay, perfect. So now we know that specimen one is positive. We go to specimen two, we do the test once, he is negative, you do the test again, he is still negative. Now, just to make sure that your test is still there, it's valid, is correct, you will not only run the PCR on the, you're not, you will not only run the PCR on the DNA that you're interested in, in this case, you were running it on the DNA of a virus, okay? You're going to run, run it on something that is present in all of your cells. In this case, it's beta actin, okay? Beta actin is present in all of your cells. You will not be able li to live without beta actin. And they did PCR for that, same exact thing. Negative would not show anything. Positive would show you something, okay? So specimen one, he was positive for beta actin. So now we know, okay, specimen one has a good exam. Yani the exam is, is fully valid. It detected the beta actin and it detected specimen one twice, yani two times, even when we repeated the exam. So we know that specimen one is for sure positive for EBV, EBV, okay? But specimen two is negative and you can never be negative for beta actin. So we can assume that the test went wrong, that the patients, like we didn't get a correct sample from the patient. Point is, this is a false negative. Specimen two is a false negative. You need to redo the examination or something. Something went wrong, okay? Is this clear to everyone? Clear. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Now we have two different types of PCR. First one is called endpoint PCR, and this is also known as conventional PCR. This is exactly what we were seeing here, okay? It will only tell you whether you have a positive or a negative result. We cannot, say, we cannot tell anything different about whatever DNA sample we're dealing with right at the moment. It's just positive or negative for this DNA, okay? And then a real-time PCR will give you the, it will quantify it for you, okay? So it will tell you the exact concentration of the DNA that you're looking for. You have exactly this much of the DNA that you're looking for. Or it will tell you like relative, relative to a control, you have a lot more, you have a lot less. But the point is, it's going to give you a quantity. It's going to give you a number. And point PCR, it's either it's there, positive, or it's not there, negative, nothing else, okay? So something that I want to bring to your attention is that real-time PCR is also known as quantitative PCR, which is qPCR. 
But there is something else that is called reverse transcription PCR, which we refer to as RT-PCR, okay? So you will not get any RT is not an acronym for real time. If you ever want to say real time PCR, they will spell it out for you, real time PCR. If you ever see RT-PCR, that is your reverse transcription PCR. And as we said before, the real time PCR is essentially quantifying it. It's giving you uh, like an amount of the DNA material that you're looking for. And reverse transcription PCR, it can also quantify if they refer to it as RTQ PCR, okay? Because the Q PCR is just going Q PCR. But the point is RT stands for reverse transcription and you usually use reverse transcription. Yeah, uh, you usually use reverse transcription PCR because you're trying to detect RNA. So before, I didn't emphasize on this much before, but you know I'm gonna emphasize it right now. DNA, I mean, PCR is usually used to analyze DNA only, okay? We kept saying DNA, 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 but well, let's say you're trying to deal with RNA because for example, COVID is an RNA virus. It's not a DNA virus, okay? So you will use this reverse transcription PCR, which will use reverse transcriptase to go from the RNA back to the DNA, and then you'll proceed with normal PCR. And yes, it can be a quantitative PCR, but point is do not confuse real-time PCR with reverse transcription PCR. Reverse transcription PCR will be referred to as RT-PCR. Real-time PCR, they will either tell you real-time PCR, when they will tell you Q-PCR, which is the exact same thing, interchangeable. Clear? Okay, I'm assuming so. Now we're going to have the Q-PCR detection systems because we said in the quantitative PCR is telling you the quantity. It's going to tell you the amount. So how does it do that? He gave you this whole list, He but he only wants you to know Cyber Green, and he wants you to know Cleavage Bay's Tacman. Okay, Cyber Green, you are going to following the process of uh, PCR. You have the denaturation step. They are separated. Nothing is binding, so there's a weak background fluorescence. Okay, because of the Cyber Green, but nothing actually bound yet. The fluorescence is very like weak. You're not seeing anything just yet, and this is in your denaturation step of the PCR. And then you're going to move on to your annealing step. Okay, in the annealing step we said that the primers are binding. So from there, once you have DNA binding to the single-stranded DNA, you're gonna start emitting light. But here it's only the primer. Here it's only the primer. In the annealing step, it's only the primer. So you have, you're emitting some light. It's not that much. It's in the extension, the elongation step, that you will get a huge spike in the light emission because your cyber green dye will start binding to the DNA a lot more and you're gonna get this huge surge of fluorescence. and that's how you're gonna know, okay, this is how many PCR reactions I have going on at the moment. And then what's gonna happen is that, you know how we said um, the cycle will repeat? So the very, like, okay, let's go back up to this picture over here. Here, this one, even with the amplified, the cloned DNA is gonna go back up and it's gonna denature. So the denaturation is gonna occur here in the middle here, okay? What's going to happen is that once this denatures, once this new double-stranded DNA denatures, the cyber green will let go again. It will start back up here. So you're gonna have a drop in fluorescence, okay? So the point of me saying all of this is that you should measure the fluorescence of cyber green at the end of the extension step and before the denaturation step, because that's the one with the most amount, that's the one with the highest fluorescence, and it's right before it like drops back down to zero because you're den denaturing again. Uh, is everyone, does everyone understand this concept? Clear. Okay, and now we're going to talk about cleavage based assays, which is TACMAN. Uh, basically, you're going to have your reverse primer on this side, and then you're going to have your forward primer on this side, and now you have a probe. Again, we're talking about probes. So Cyber Green does not have this probe, and this probe is a good thing. Like cleavage based TACMAN is a is a better way to assess the quantity, but it is cheaper. So people usually go for, I mean, it is more expensive to pay for the probe. And these two are very cheap, okay? But this one is expensive. So people usually settle, settle for cyber. But if you want more accurate results, you have to go for the probe. How does this probe work? It has a reporter side and it has a quencher side. And when these two are intact, when they're together, this is supposed to secrete signals, but the quencher is inhibiting it, okay? So currently you do not have a signal emitted, okay? But then we have the forward primer, so you'll have the TAC polymerase over here, and it's doing DNA replication, DNA synthesis, and it reaches the probe. And what it does is, is that it's going to break the probe. And now the quencher is far away from the reporter, and you will have a signal emitted. So it's a lot more accurate, 
and it will like it will tell you an accurate quantity of PCR going on at the moment, okay? But it is more expensive, so people usually go for cyber green. Cyber green might sometimes buy into the wrong spot. They might give you a little bit more, a little bit less. That's just essentially the idea between the two. Is it clear? Okay, I'm assuming as much. So back to endpoint PCR, which we said is your conventional PCR, the one that will only give you a oops, the one that will only give you a positive or a negative. Technically, you can get a quantity from this type of PCR because you're using gel electrophoresis, right? So you can't you can kind of get a quantity, but you'll have to take multiple samples over and over again, and you're gonna have to do the gel electrophoresis over and over again, and then it's gonna look something like this. It's a very it's not efficient. The data is not useful, which is why you need the qPCR, the one that we just explained here and here, oops, here and here. The qPCR, it's just going, you're going to run it by a machine and the machine will give you this kind of graph, okay? And in this graph, you have the lag phase. So in here, PCR is happening. DNA uh, amplification is also happening. It just did not pass the threshold of fluorescence. So it has a certain like the machine has a certain thresh threshold of fluorescence. It needs a certain amount of fluorescent signals to really pick up and show you all the PCR amplification. And then this is called the log phase where the PCR amplification is very clear. It can count it very clearly. Here, it's not like there's no DNA replication going on. There is, PCR is going, look at the cycles, but it's just not as easy to detect because it's uh, below the threshold. And then you re reach a plateau. Why do we reach a plateau? We do not know. People are hypothesizing, hypothesizing, but nobody knows. It's not important. Those are just the three place, phases of the graph. And uh, yeah, why do we use this graph? Because you need to, okay, you need to understand this concept, but hopefully I'll explain it well. So first of all, you have your input value, your initial value, okay? And this is the initial value of uh, DNA that you, you're starting off with. This is before you reach the threshold or the minimum, you know, fluorescence power for it to actually reach the log phase. So that is your input value, okay? And then you have your threshold, the amount of fluorescence that you need for the machine to start detecting like strong fluorescence signals, okay? The input value is inversely proportional to the threshold cycle, as in cycle number, okay? So let's say your like input value is like, if you have a lot of DNA, I, I can't give it a specific number, but if you have a high concentration of DNA, if you have a high input value, then you will reach the threshold faster because you're, even though you're only multiplying one, two, three, you're, you have a higher input value. You're like in this one cycle, you replicated about, about, about 500 times, okay? And then you do it again. So now you're like 1000 times, okay? And this will make you reach a threshold faster, meaning your threshold cycle number is lower, okay? But if your input value is low, so let's say you start off with 20 and then it becomes 40, and then it becomes 60. By the time you reach like 1000, how many threshold cycle, how many cycles would you have done? I don't know, like four or five, six, a lot until you reach like the 1000 in comparison to if you start off with a higher concentration of DNA. And it's not even about starting off with a higher concentration of DNA. It's about the ability of the, like the specific PCR to multiply. Like you could start off with 20, and then you, you duplicate it like 500 times because that's just how good the enzyme and that's, that's just how good the test ran, okay? But the whole point is, if you have a higher input value, the, your threshold cycle will be lower. Let's ask about it this way. Which would contain more DNA? A threshold cycle of 22 or 42? Who can try and answer this for me? Can I repeat the question? Absolutely. Which would contain more DNA? A threshold, a threshold cycle of 22 or 42? Uh, 22. Yes, it is 22. Can you explain why? Uh, because uh, because it, it, like, it requires less cycles to reach the threshold. Exactly. Okay. So does everyone understand that? Will that should I go over the concept again? I don't mind going over it again. Uh, okay, I, I didn't get anything, so yes, okay, I will go again. So what I was trying to say here is that, okay, let me just erase all of this. Let's say you have a cycle 
where you have 20, okay? And then you have an input, you have a very high input value. So it's able to multiply a lot more. So you're going to go from 20 to 400 in one cycle, okay? And then you're going to go again and it's going to go up to 800. Okay, the, the actual numbers don't matter. The point is you're able to amount to a high amount of DNA in a short period of time. You're able to reach it, like your input value is high because input value is not like the, it's not the value of DNA that you start with, no. It's the initial amount of DNA that you have here before you reach the threshold. It's, it's the one that's in your initial phase of your reaction, okay? And then in another one, you have 20, but you only go up to 40, then you go up to 80 whatever, it just, it's not multiplying as much, okay? So here you have a higher concentration of DNA, you have a higher input value, and that means you're going to reach the threshold cycle value. Let's say the threshold cycle value was um, at least 1,000 for you to break into this fluorescent area. Is this much clear? Do you guys understand what I mean by threshold cycle value? Perfect, okay. So you would need to reach like 1,000, okay? And in this one, in A, okay, you're able to reach a lot faster, okay? By the fourth cycle, you're already up in 1,400. And that's your fourth cycle, okay? But in experiment B, you're only at like 120, let's say, in your fourth cycle. So because experiment A has a higher input value, her, the threshold cycle is lower. It's only four for them to reach the threshold of 1,000. Okay, so when I was asking the question, which contains more DNA, a threshold cycle of 22 or 42, when we see a threshold cycle of 22, it means that this experiment only needed to do the cycle 22 times for it to break past the threshold and to go into this region. But when I say, you know, it's 42, that means they had to go all the way up to here to break past the threshold value and to actually go up into this fluorescent region. Okay, so which is why we say that 22 is, uh, contains more DNA because it's able to reach the threshold a lot faster. Is this clear? Okay, I'm gonna assume it is a yes, inshallah. And uh, now we're gonna move, okay, perfect. Now we're gonna move on to COVID-19 tests, like uh, applications of PCR. First most common application is the COVID-19 tests. Okay, so we have two different types of tests. We have the diagnostic test and the antibody test. Antibody test is done is serologically. So you're just taking the blood and you're seeing whether this patient has antibodies for COVID. But then the diagnostic test is the one that actually uses the PCR. So like antibody test does not use PCR. It has nothing to do with PCR. You will just take the antibodies and you will test for the antibodies, okay? But diagnostic tests, you do need PCR. And you are going to do you either have the molecular test, which will test the viral genetic material. So you're testing the DNA, the RNA of the virus, or you are testing the antigens. Antigens are the viral proteins on the virus, okay? So again, molecular test, you're testing the genetic material, you're testing the RNA, but the antigens, you're testing the proteins, okay? Before we move on to the difference between the two, because we are gonna talk about it, you need to understand the concept of sensitivity and specificity specificity oh, specificity very well okay so sensitivity is going to tell you that like the test is going to tell you i detected something okay you are positive for something there is a chance that this something was not the thing that you're looking for but can i detect that there is something in the first place yes okay so it's going to tell you how good is this test as at what it's looking for even if there is a small tiny amount of something it will immediately detect it okay so it can detect something but specificity, it's how good this test is at, identify, at identifying only the thing that you're looking for. So, okay, since you're very sensitive, you, you can detect something very easily. But is this something the right thing? So that is what specificity will tell you. And they're very important metrics of tests, of clinical exams. Um, usually when you go up with the specificity, the sensitivity goes down. So I don't know what you're supposed to do with that, but does everyone understand what, sens what sensitivity and specific specificity is? Okay, I'll assume yes. Um, I'll assume yes. And now we will move on to the two different tests that we were talking about, okay? We have the molecular test and we have the antigen test. 
molecular test we said will test the RNA, okay? And it, it, it has a very high sensitivity and specificity, specificity, okay? But the antigen test, it tests for the proteins and it has kind of a low sensitivity. So like 80% is pretty low when you compare it to 98%. So sometimes you might get a neg negative but you're not actually negative, which is why sometimes you do need to confirm your negatives with a molecular assay because when you're losing out on 20% of the things, and yani 20% of the time, it's not going to detect something. And when you're dealing with COVID, yani, it's a pretty big deal, especially when we were back at the pandemic time, right? So when is the antigen test used? We, If you guys ever did the home PCR kit for COVID, the one that you could just buy from the pharmacy and do it at home, that was an antigen test. So, okay. Yeah, that's just the application that he wanted you to know. Uh, COVID-19, RT, qPCR, we mentioned this aerial, earlier. RT, which is reverse transcriptase, which will turn the RNA of the virus into DNA that you can actually analyze with the PCR. So RT stands for, stands for reverse transcriptase. Q is for the quantitative. So you're here, he's doing the graph. Nothing much to know from here, honestly. Okay, now we're going to talk about even more applications. So you have PCR for prenatal screening. So prenatal screening is when you have the baby, you know, it's an embryo, it's a fetus, and you want to make sure that this fetus does not have any really bad abnormalities. So if you're testing at 10 weeks, then the sample would be from the chorionic villus. If you're testing at 16 weeks, then you're going to do amniocentesis, okay? And then you're just going to do the normal PCR. You're going to look for any genetic mutations. This is just, you know, an application. When do you use it? And uh, severe, it just screens for severe fetal defects, okay? Excuse me. Okay. So something I wrote at the bottom here is that you usually use, like the thing is Southern blotting can also be used for prenatal screening, right? But why do we not use it for prenatal screening? And this is pretty important to understand. It's because when you're doing prenatal screening or when you're dealing with the cells of the fetus, you don't want to take too much because that might cause a miscarriage in a perfectly healthy baby, right? So that's why we usually prefer PCR-based procedures because you don't need that many, that big of a sample just a little, then you amplify it loads to get the thing that you need. But there's no amplification in southern blotting, so you might end up taking too many cells and that might cause issues later on, okay? And then you have the pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. This is when you do an embryo fertilization in vitro, so it's like in a test tube outside the uterus. And then at the eight or, oops, okay. At the eight or 16 cell stage, you will screen the cells and make sure that there's no mutation. This is done using PCR. And then if it's healthy, you'll just... Okay, sorry about that. Um, then you're going to return the embryo into the uterus, okay? Does that sound clear? Does anyone have any questions about the applications? Okay, I'm assuming there's nothing, honestly, because it's just applications, right? Now, here we have the PCR for cystic fibros fibrosis deletion. It's the exact same concept as the southern blotting, the same electrophoresis chart that we showed you earlier. So you're going to take a normal a normal person's sample for CFTR, cystic fibrosis, okay? And you're going to add the primer and you're going to amplify the gene. Same thing here. You have the mutated one and you're going to add the primer and you're going to, you're going to amplify the gene. And then you're going to run your gel electrophoresis as we mentioned before. Now, if you remember... The cystic fibrosis is like a mutation in the 50A gene. Point is, it's going to remove three nucleotides. Okay, so if you remove three nucleotides, obviously your DNA is smaller with the mutation. And now you will apply the exact same concept as we did earlier. Okay, so six, like 60 would be further. Okay, here you have your anode, here you have your cathode. 60 is smaller, so it will travel further down. 63 is the, the big one, it's the normal one. Here you have a normal person. They're only expressing the normal fragment, which is 63. Th this is the carrier. He's expressing both. This is a homozygous mutant. So he only has the shorter version of the gene. Is this clear to everyone? It's the exact same concept as earlier. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. I'm going to assume it is clear. Okay. Now we're going to move on to the genetic, genetic part of the the lecture. So polymorphisms are DNA variations in the population who are very frequent, okay? The frequency has to be at least 1%. They're harmless, okay? They're found in everyone. So you have one, which is single nucleotide polymorphism. Well, okay, just to go back on what I said, they're not always harmless, but any, for the most part, they're harmless. Sometimes they can cause actual mutations though. Point is they're very common. The fact that they're harmless or not is not the point. The point is that they are very, very common, okay? Okay, so you have your single nucleotide polymorphism. 
this is a single nucleotide mutation. So you have like A, G, G, C, T. The mutation would literally just be A, uh, G, C, G, T. This is not complementary to this, by the way. Like this is not supposed to be complementary to each other. I'm just telling you in one person, this is how the code would read. In another person, it's the exact, it's supposed to be the exact same code, but the G got turned into a C. And that is like your mutation. It's, it's in a single nucleotide. And it's the most common one. And then you have something called your variable number of tandem repeats. So sometimes you have sequences of nucleotides that are just like A, 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 T, okay? So some in some people, this could be repeated like eight times in a row. In other people, it could be repeated like 10 times in a row. So they're more often in other, like that's the, mu the mutation, that they're more often repeated, okay? Short tandem repeat, it's when you have the same exact concept, but they're just shorter sequences. So cat is repeated over and over again, cat. Oops, like C-A-T, it's not cat, but you got it. Like C-A-T is repeated like eight times, but the mutation would make it repeat like only five times, less often. And it's a shorter sequence. Okay, is that clear with everyone? Okay. There. Thank you. Uh, you'll see this concept again in genetics. It's not really the focus of the lecture here. Okay, so these mutations, the whole point is that these mutations is going to cause something called a poly, uh, it's going to cause something called a restriction site polymorphism or restriction fragment length polymorphism, RSF, RSP, RFLP. Those mean the exact same thing. They're just interchangeable. And this is the more commonly used word. Okay. So you have a mutation. It, it, it's going to either create or remove or like lose a restriction site. This is exactly what we were talking about with the Southern blotting. So this isn't, this isn't really a technique. This is just giving you a name to what we learned before earlier. So you know how we said there are genetic mutations that can cause a loss or a gain of restriction site? One of you girls asked me, like, do we have a, a specific name for them? Do we have a specific example? The, the name would be restriction fragment length polymorphism because they're changing this, the size of a, the restriction site. They're either removing one, they're either creating one. And you can use, like, you can analyze them through Southern blotting or PCR, okay? So just one thing to note, we do not use PC Southern blotting anymore. Exactly as I said earlier, number one, you would, near, you would need a huge DNA sample. Like you would need a bigger DNA sample for Southern blotting. Also, it, it's just outdated. It's, it takes a lot longer. It's more expensive. Nobody likes using it anymore. But you need to be able to read the, the test results, okay? So you guys know how to, to read them anyway, so it's, it's fine. Okay, this is the exact same concept as before. So I'm just going to ask you guys to try and solve it with me. Uh, in this case, I'm giving you a, like an example, okay? You have a mute. PKU, it's like a, you, you'll take it further on in the, in the MOL2 course. It's called phenyl urea, something like that. I forgot my bad. Okay. Point is it has a mutate, mutated PAH gene that will cause an addition of a restriction site. Addition of restriction site, meaning that you will cut the DNA at a place you're not supposed to. So now you'll have a smaller fragment. So it will travel further in the gel electrophoresis. So same thing as before. Can someone just quickly walk me through, is this, um, is this a carrier? Is it homozygous normal, heterozygous, uh, or homozygous abnormal? Let's start with here. One. We're almost done. Uh, one, two, and uh, five are heterozygous. Yes, exactly. Um, one is a mutant or homo homozygous for the abnormality and uh, four and uh, six are normal. Four, four and six are normal. Why did you say four and six are, no are normal? Keeping in mind the mutation that I just told you, the mutant PAH gene. Because, because the mutant gene has uh, shorter, has smaller fragments. Or wait, hold on. Mutant gene would have smaller fragments. Mm. Okay. So the person would have oh. an extra restriction site and smaller DNA fragments. So would four and six be mutated or would they be normal? Oh yeah, th yeah, they're they're abnormal. Four and six are abnormal and three is uh, normal. Yes, exactly. And even in the chat, you guys got it correct. These two has have PKU. This one is normal. The rest are carrier. Okay. So for whoever was asking me about a specific example about when you would lose or gain a restriction site, it just depends on the disease. An example, in PKU, the mutant PAH gene would actually cause you to uh, gain a restriction site. So you'd have smaller fragments, okay? 
And here's just the answer key. It's fine. Okay, now you have sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell, cell anemia would cause a loss of a restriction site. Okay, so that means um, it would travel slower. It would be closer to the point of origin, which is here. So here, SS stands for sickle cell. You do have a sickle cell. AS means sickle trait, which means you do not have sickle cell, but you do, you're a carrier. AA, you're normal. It's fine. It's far. It's further down. We won't go over it to just to save time because, yeah. Okay. And this is exactly what I was telling you earlier. Southern blotting, it's outdated. It needs a lot of DNA. It can, you know, you can't use it in prenatal screen, screening, all of those stuff. Um, you use PCR instead and you use DNA sequencing, which we will get to in a bit. Just keep that in mind. So if you get a multiple choice question, I don't know if you'll get it for you like this, but if you, if you get a multiple choice question and you're between Southern blotting and PCR, always use, always choose PCR because PCR is a more modern way to do it. Because they all have similar applications, I'm sure, as you guys saw with the electrophoresis. Okay, DNA fingerprinting. So essentially, you remember how we were talking about variable number of tandem repeats? These are going to do the exact same concept. They're going to create a loss or a gain of restriction site. The whole point is that DNA fingerprinting uses these to for paternity testing or forensic research, okay? And it's, it's really not that different. So what are the steps? Number one, you take the blood sample. If you're doing like a forensic study, you take the blood sample, you extract the DNA and you cut the DNA using restriction enzymes. Now the DNA is smaller and you can actually do the analysis. Then you're going to do VNTR. Uh, you're not gonna do VNTR, excuse me. The VNTR will cause variations in the length of the fragments. It's gonna create the RFLPs that we were talking about earlier. Because of the restriction enzymes, there is a loss whether there is a gain, it depends, okay? And the whole point is that VNTRs are found in people. So some people will, ha will, will have a natural loss of restriction site, okay? And the others would have a gain. And this is how we can tell different people apart, okay? That's the whole point, that DNA fingerprinting is using VNTRs because they will cause loss of sight or gain of sight naturally. And it's, it's not like you're testing for a mutation, it's just natural in our genes, okay? And uh, then you're going to use the agarose gel, electrophoresis to, you know, separate the sizes. And then you're gonna do Southern blotting so you're able to actually analyze it. We don't use Southern blotting anymore. I just brought the concept up, but he mentioned it as Southern blotting in this case, but it's okay. Like the concept still stands. You use Southern blotting if PCR is not mentioned, but if it's between Southern blotting and PCR, you will use PCR, okay? And then uh, you will add the probe and you will see, okay. You, you will analyze the DNA from there because the probe will outline the genes that you're interested in. It's just a bunch of talk. It's the same thing that we mentioned earlier. Let's just jump straight into a question. Uh, do you guys want, let me just orient you with what the question is asking. Here you have the mother's genes, okay? This side is the mother's genes. This is the ch child's genes. And this is the father's genes, okay? And they're asking, is this child from both of these parents? Or, you know, is, there, is, it, is it a false paternity? Is the child adopted? Who wants to try, you know, answering this? I'll give you guys a moment. If nobody knows how to, it's okay. Same concept applies, by the way. It's like, here's the plus, you're traveling down, same concept. Uh, do you guys have a difficulty solving? Well, uh, do you need a moment? Is it D? Yes. Yes, it is D. Okay, how? Basically, we just got the mother's DNA. Okay, so we got the mother's uh, genes, whatever, and we put them down the gel electrophoresis, and they're displayed like this. Okay, you have this heavy one, this less heavy, whatever. You could just see the, the mom's genes. If my guess is wrong, I don't get false paternity. Okay, it's fine. We will explain uh, exactly why it's D. It's actually D. This is the child of these two parents, okay? So you have the mother's genes, okay? They're expressed here. And then you have the father's genes, and they're expressed here. And then you could see the child is sharing some with the mom and some with the dad, okay? Like, he has the same as the mom here. He has the same as the dad here. Same as the mom, same as the dad. That already explains it, by the way. Like, that alone should let you know. If the child has these four... Sorry, sorry. Okay, if the child has these four... And he got this one from the mom, and he got this one from the dad, and he got this one from the mom, and he got this one from the dad. Then obviously this child is from these, these two parents. 
And obviously, the mom will not share anything with the child. I mean, the mom will not share anything with the father. Okay, unless there's consanguinity involved, but this is not the case here. And you might be like, okay, so since we can see that the child's genes are from either the mom or the dad, we're like, okay, this is the correct maternity and the paternity. But if the child, for example, has this one over here and it's not shared with either, then okay, then you could start thinking maybe the child is adopted or something because he has some genes that he does not share with either of them. But um, I don't think it would ever be that tricky. Like, Yanni, if he's going to give you a very clear one where it's either he shares something with like the mother, but he does not share it with the father. And in that case, it's false paternity. That is not the right dad. Okay. If, for example, he does not share anything with the dad, ignore all of this. Okay. And it's only with the mom, then you could assume that it's a false paternity. Okay. But in this case, he has correct maternity. And paternity, it's very simple. Is that uh, clear to everyone? Okay, I'll assume as much. I do not know why it's not going down. Okay. Oh, now we are we are going on to the DNA sequencing. Um, do you guys want a break or should I just wrap the lecture up? Because we are in the last two techniques. But we can take a five minute break. Okay, I'm sorry about not noticing the break earlier. We will definitely take the break now because I was too focused on uh, explaining. Can I get a signal to know that you guys are back and seated with Lelissa? I'm here. Okay. Just, I don't know, so one other person in the chat just to be sure maybe, or not, it's fine, I don't know. We can just start. It's okay, the recording will be there if somebody wanted a longer break, they can, okay, yalla, you're back. Thank God, yalla, let's begin. These are like the last two techniques anyway, so inshallah we, we can get them done quick. First of all, you have the DNA sequencing. Also, also one thing I'd like to bring to your attention is that at this point, your recording stopped. Like I didn't get the recording for anything past DNA sequencing. So unfortunately, I do not have Dr. Ahmed's explanation in here, but I think it's going to be the same inshallah from here on out. So you guys can go back to the recording for this specific part if, if you would like. Okay. Let's proceed. So DNA sequencing, from the name, you're trying to determine the base sequences of your DNA. And before you do that, you need to, magnif you need to magnify your DNA. You need to amplify it. And this can be done using PCR or DNA cloning. So keep in mind, in DNA sequencing, when you're using the Sagner method, you're, doing, you're amplifying the DNA first. So you're either doing PCR or DNA cloning. Okay? And then uh, you are going to... Now we're going to begin with the Sagner method, okay? So first thing you're going to do after you um, amplify the DNA is that you're going to make it single-stranded. You're going to denature it to make it single-stranded. And then you are going to add a radioactive primer, okay? So it's a primer that is radioactive, whatever. And this will initiate the DNA synthesis, okay? And then you're going to add the four deoxyribonucleoside triphosphate. So you're going to add your base pairs, okay? Because obviously this is the same concept as with the PCR. When you're amplifying or when you're synthesizing DNA, you need the base pairs. So you're going to add them to the mix, okay? And then you're going to divide your sample into four different tubes. Why? We will get to that right now. Because you're also going to add this other type of base pair, this fake base pair, right? It's called dideoxyribonucleoside triphosphate, okay? And this one, like it's the same concept as adenine, guanine, cytosine, thyronine, but it's um, it's special because it does not have the oxygen on carbon two or three, meaning and this oxygen is oxygen is very important for DNA elongation. Like you, your other base pairs when they're trying to bind during DNA synthesis, they need this ox oxygen. But this special dideoxyribonucleoside, the DDNTP, will does not have this oxygen. Okay, and that means it will stop DNA elongation. Okay, and so again, why do we have the four different tubes? Because in the first tube, you will have the fake DDNTP for adenine, okay? Second tube, it's guanine, third tube, it's th uh, threonine, and then C, I mean, third, fourth tube is cy cytosine, okay? And this is what's going to cause you to have different DNA fragments based on like different DNA, di different lengths, okay? And uh, as I said before, every tube will have a specific DDNTP. There's one for adenine, guanine, Cytosine, so on and so forth. And then now you have all of you have your tubes, right? So you have this tube. We had the D D A T P in this one. So you have a bunch of DNA. They like 
just to keep things in mind, in this tube, you have the fake one, and you also have all four of the real ones, okay? So DNA synthesis will occur in this tube. You will have, like, you'll have the radioactive primer and your single-stranded DNA, and you will have DNA synthesis. But then at a random point, we don't know when, at a random point, this fake one will come and bind instead, and the DNA synthesis will stop. And then you're going to do gel electrophoresis for this one, and you're going to be able to spell out the base pairs. And from there, you can do the sequencing. Yani, from there, you can just do normal sequencing, okay? So before, this was done using radioactive primers. But now it's a little bit outdated because obviously radioactive is bad for the person who is dealing with it, who is handling it. So we use fluorescent labeled DD and TPs. And uh, yeah, the, like in the end, the analysis could be done by a screen nowadays instead of doing the gel electrophoresis where you have to literally get the strand and then see the difference between one base pair using the page, the polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. And then you could spell it out yourself. We don't need to do that anymore. We use a screen, okay? And that's it. That's the Sagner method. I think the most important thing he wants you to know is that we will use this fake dideoxy ribonucleoside triphosphates. Okay, these are fake ones because they are they do not have the oxygen, so they will bind like normal. So if you have A, it will bind to T normally. Okay, but nothing like it does not have oxygen, so you will not be able to continue after it. It will stop the DNA in elongation, and then you will have all of these different fragments. And you're going to do gel electrophoresis, and that's going to spell it out for you. And that is how you sequence DNA. Okay, that's exactly what this diagram is showing you. You're going to prepare four reaction mixtures, one with every single of the, one of the fake ones, and then you're going to follow it with gel electrophoresis to kind of spell it out. Okay, is this clear to everyone? Clear. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Here, I was just showing you the different types. Okay, so we have the primer, and then we, we start DNA synthesis. And then here, you reach the fake T, it stops elongation. And then you're gonna take this and you're gonna put it in gel electrophoresis. Same thing uh, in this one. C, it stops elongation. See how, how they're, they're all at random points. So some of them are 21, some of them are 22, whatever. Point is, you get them, you stop them, you make different fragments, and then you put them in electrophoresis, and now you can read out the basic sequence. That is the most important point, okay? Is that clear? I think I think it is. Okay. And now we have microarrays, which are our last technique. And uh, this one is used to study DNA or RNA. And the most important part about this is that you're using it to study thousands of genes at once. Okay. Let's just skip down here. The most common application is that he is going to bring you a case where you're trying to compare two different tumor cells or you're trying to compare a normal cell with a tumor cell. And the point is you're you're trying to compare all of their genes. So which one is present only in the tumor cell? Which one is only present in the normal cell? Which one is is present in both? How do we do that? Okay. First of all, get your sample. Here's our normal healthy cell. Let's put that in green because we, we will be putting it in green. So here's our normal healthy cell. And here's our cancer, cancer cell, okay? You'll get the mRNA, mRNA, which you're trying to analyze, but you're going to still apply the same concept of reverse transcriptase to get it to complementary DNA, okay? And now you have the complementary DNA from the normal healthy cell, Let's keep that in green because we're going to label it with a green fluorescent molecule. And then you're going to get the complementary DNA for the cancer cell, and you're going to label it with red, okay? Uh, up until now, I think we are all clear. And then you're going to have this microchip, this microplate, okay? And it has, thou it has thousands of wells, okay? But in this well, in this little pocket, we have a probe, okay? And we said probe is a complementary single-stranded DNA sequence that is trying to help you identify a gene of interest. So this probe, let's say it's for the BCRA gene. We know if there's a mutation in this gene, let's put here M for mutated, and then here we have a pocket for the non-mutated one. Okay, BCRA, normal, N. This is mutated. So what you're going to do is that you're going to bring your normal sample. Okay, let's keep that in green. You're going to bring your normal sample and you're going to put it in here and then you're going to wash it off, okay? If it bound, if this sample, this complementary DNA sample from your normal cell does have the BCRA mutation, it will bind to the probe. And when you try to wash it off, it will stay stuck. But that's not the case here because it's normal. So what's going to happen is that it's going to get washed out. But then you go to the other well where you have the normal one. So it's going to come here and it's going to bind. 
And now this well will appear green, as you can see in here. Actually, let me use a, a red. As you can see in here, this is a gene that is only present in the normal one, okay? Now, what about the, uh, the abnormal one, okay? So you're gonna put in the genetic information from the cancer cell, you're gonna put it in this well, and it's going to bind. So when you try to wash it off, it will not move, it will stay bound, okay? So now this well will grow, will glow red because it is expressed by the cancer cell, okay, this one. So this is in cancer, this one is in normal, okay? So what about if it's present in both? Because there are a lot of stuff that are present in both, you will, let's say, instead of the BCRA gene mutation, I don't know, beta actin, like, I don't know if this is a legit thing. I'm just saying, like, let's say beta actin is present in all cells. So if you test for beta actin in the cancer cell and in the normal cell, it will, both of them will stick. Yani, you will put the normal first, you will wash it out, and it will not get washed out because it is there. And then you're going to put the cancer cell, and it's not going to wash out. So now this well will glow as brown or orange because it's present in both. And it's going to do that for thousands of genes. And then you're going to put this chip in a machine which will read the results out for you so you don't have to. So the whole point of this, me explaining all of this is because I want you to understand that you're using it to compare thousands of genes between a normal or a not normal or a cancer one, or it doesn't have to be cancer. It could be like just a normal and I don't know, not normal, two cancer, two normals, stuff like that. The point is you're comparing between two things and you're comparing like a thousand, thousands of genes. Is this clear to everyone? There. Okay, and uh, yeah, checkpoint. Does anyone have any questions about anything that I explained in the entire lecture? I'm assuming not. So go ahead, please solve this question and that would be it, inshallah. Okay, someone said B or E. Okay, why would you think it is B? Why would you think it is E? Why do you think it is E? I'm very interested because two people said E up until now. Do, I mean, if you, okay, I would really appreciate it if maybe one of you could tell me why maybe it has confused you because it, the answer is B, okay? And I'll tell you why the answer is B. And if you guys would like to share why you thought it was E, I would appreciate that. Now, the answer is B, microarray, because number one, we said global patterns of gene expression. So you're you're trying to test a lot of different genes. That's one. Two, we're talking about two different types of tumor cells, okay? So you're trying to compare two, the gene set, thousands of genes, global patterns of gene expression, in two different things. It could be normal tumor, uh, like two tumor cells, or one normal cell, one tumor cell. It doesn't matter. But that is why you use microarray, because microarray will tell you, microarrays will tell you the difference in gene expressions between two things. And it would, it would tell you the difference between a lot of genes. Western blot, on the other hand, we use it to, number one, we use it to analyze proteins. So... I don't know why you guys thought Western blot exactly because there was there was no mention of protein. Yani, it's not even Southern blot either because Southern blot, you're not really using it to differentiate between a tumor cell and a, a normal cell, or, or at least you're not using it to differentiate the global pattern. Like globally, you have to think about all of the genes, okay? Another Northern blot, which is for RNA, I could see why you would think it's DNA or RNA because you are dealing, when you're talking about gene expression, you're talking about DNA or, or, or sorry, or RNA, okay? But Western blot, it's 100% proteins only. So it couldn't have been Western blot at all. Does anyone, does everyone understand why it is microarray? Okay, awesome. Perfect. And uh, it's over there. That is it. Thank you so much, guys. Please fill out the feedback form.